Hi, my name is Abtar Singh, and I'm a postdoc in the Blaney Lab at the Broad Institute. Today, I will introduce optical pooled screens, a technology that greatly enhances the perturbation throughput of image-based genetic screens. Michael Lichen, a research associate in the lab, will also join me to demonstrate the wet lab and imaging workflows. We'll also provide a brief description of the analytical pipeline. Genetic screens are a powerful tool to identify the genes relevant to biological processes or disease progression. In general, they come in two flavors, arrayed and pooled. In arrayed screens, genetic perturbations are introduced into cells across different wells of a multi-well plate. A cell-based assay, such as an imaging assay, is performed and each perturbation is assigned a phenotypic score. Hits are then called based on difference from non-targeting controls. A major advantage of image-based screens is that there are a wide variety of phenotypic assays that can be used to probe different biological pathways and cell states. However, arrayed genetic screens can be challenging to scale up because of the difficulties associated with generating and maintaining a large arrayed cell library. Meanwhile, in pooled screens, all perturbations can be synthesized and introduced into cells as a single sample, making it easier to scale up. Most pooled screens use low MOI, lentiviral transduction, and next-generation sequencing to measure the relative abundance of each perturbation before and after enrichment for a phenotype of interest. The two most common enrichment strategies are cell viability and fluorescence-activated cell sorting. Pooling helps facilitate large-scale experiments, such as comprehensive genetic screens, at low cost and minimal labor because all perturbations are handled as a single sample. Furthermore, Pooling can also improve data quality through reduction of batch effects because all perturbations experience identical cell culture and assay conditions. However, thus far, pooled screens have not been compatible with the diverse set of high-content imaging assays that are powerful tools for probing cell biology. This schematic summarizes the state of the art in pooled genetic screens. Most commonly, pooled screens use cell viability or FACs to enrich for perturbations of interest. More recently, several groups have used high-dimensional molecular readouts, such as single-cell RNA-seq and ATTACK-seq, to profile pooled libraries. These methods offer valuable insight into perturbation effects, but have been expensive to scale up to many cells. In principle, it's fairly straightforward to generate a pooled perturbation library and perform a high-content assay to score single-cell phenotypes based on imaging features. However, this is only useful if we can link the phenotypic information with the underlying perturbation identities. Optical pooled screens fill in this missing information by using in situ sequencing to read out genetic perturbations in each cell directly under the microscope. To accomplish this, sequences identifying perturbations must be enzymatically amplified in situ before sequencing. First, perturbations, or associated barcodes, are expressed as RNA inside cells. The cells are then fixed and permeabilized, and the RNA is reverse transcribed into cDNA. Next, during the padlock extension reaction, a padlock probe binds to constant regions in the cDNA, flanking the perturbation. A polymerase then fills in the padlock gap, copying over the perturbation information, and the padlock is circularized by a thermostable ligase. This circular molecule can then serve as a template for rolling circle amplification, or RCA, where the 3' to 5' exonuclease activity of Phi29 DNA polymerase first chews back the cDNA until it can access the padlock template and extend the cDNA. It then copies the padlock multiple times over into a long linear RCA amplicon with many repeats of the perturbation information. Next, a sequencing primer is annealed to each of the identical loci in the RCA amplicon, and perturbations are read out by in situ sequencing. In this protocol, sequencing by synthesis is performed using reagents from an Illumina MySeq kit. First, cells are incubated with an incorporation mix, which consists of all four DNTPs, each labeled with a different fluorescent dye and reversible terminator group that ensures only a single base position is read out per cycle. After incorporation, the cells are imaged under a standard research microscope, and the color of the RCA amplicon indicates the nucleotide identity at the first base position. Next, we use a cleavage mix to remove the fluorescent dye and terminator from the incorporated base, 
priming the sample for the next round of sequencing. After another incorporation step, the cells are imaged to read out the second base position. By performing multiple rounds of sequencing, we can uniquely resolve all perturbations in a complex library. One of the key advantages of RCA is the signal amplification that facilitates low magnification readout of perturbation identities. In our first screen, we were able to image around 3,000 HeLa cells in a single field of view at 10x magnification, and easily acquired nine cycles of sequencing from millions of cells in a few days. Now, we will demonstrate the optical pooled screening workflow using a P65 localization assay in a six-wall plate of HeLa cells. First, seed 400,000 cells per well in 2 milliliters of media and incubate at 37C to yield approximately 80 to 90% confluency 48 hours later. This bright field image shows how the cells should look when ready. Next, remove the media, stimulate cells with 2 milliliters media containing either TNF alpha or IL 1 beta, and incubate at 37C for 40 minutes. Remove media and fix with 4% paraformaldehyde in PBS for 30 minutes at room temperature. When adding liquids to the plate, pipette gently against the side of the well to avoid displacing the cells. When finished, cover the plate with a foil lid to shield from unwanted debris. Next, wash the plate three times with one milliliter of PBS and permeabilize with one milliliter of 70% ethanol for 30 minutes at room temperature. Next, remove 500 microliters of ethanol. Serially add and remove one milliliter of PBST six times. Avoid exposing the plate surface to air until ethanol is diluted out. Finally, remove all liquid and perform three additional PBST washes. Now, prepare the reverse transcription reaction mix and add 750 microliters to each well. Fill the space between wells with nuclease-free water to prevent drying. Seal with an aluminum lid and shake overnight. The next day, wash six times with PBST and fix with 3% paraformaldehyde and 0.1% glutaraldehyde in PBS for 30 minutes at room temperature. Wash three times with PBST and stain with P65 primary antibody for one hour at room temperature. Then, wash three times with PBST and incubate with secondary antibody for 45 minutes at room temperature. Wash three times with PBST and add 500 microliters of gap fill reaction mix to each well. Place the plate on a flat top thermocycler and heat for five minutes at 37C, then 90 minutes at 45C. Wash three times with PBST and add 500 microliters of RCA reaction mix to each well. Avoid thawing Fe29 unnecessarily as it is a sensitive enzyme. We generally keep it in a pre-chilled benchtop cooler and minimize time outside of the freezer. Incubate at 30C overnight. The next day, wash three times with PBST and add two milliliters of DAPI solution. Perform phenotype imaging on a high-throughput screening microscope. After imaging, wash the plate three times with PBST. The sample is now ready for sequencing. Anneal a sequencing primer for 30 minutes at room temperature. Wash excess primer with Illumina PR2 buffer three times. Thaw Illumina sequencing reagents and add 500 microliters of incorporation mix to each well and incubate for five minutes at 60C. Next, wash the plate with PR2 six times in quick succession. Then wash five times at 60C for five minutes each to minimize background fluorescence. After washing, stain the nuclei with DAPI solution and acquire the first cycle of sequencing data, carefully ensuring the sample alignment and image positions match the phenotypic data. Next, prepare the sample for the second cycle of sequencing. First, Exchange DAPI for 500 microliters of alumina cleavage mix and incubate at 60C for 6 minutes. Wash 3 times with 1 milliliter PR2 at room temperature. Then, wash 3 times with 1 milliliter PR2 at 60C for 1 minute each. Do 3 additional washes with 1 milliliter PR2 at room temperature for 1 minute each. Finally, 
incorporate the next nucleotide position as before and image. Although this protocol shows antibody staining after the post-fixation step, several other workflows are possible to accommodate different assays. Please refer to this table and the accompanying manuscript for more information. Image-based readout of cellular phenotypes and genetic perturbations is performed on a wide-field fluorescence microscope customized for high-throughput screening with an automated stage, broadband or multicolor light source, sensitive camera, and autofocus capability. We provide microscope designs in the accompanying manuscript. Multiple cycles of sequencing are aligned to each other and to the phenotypic data by physically aligning the imaging fields across acquisitions and then refining computationally by image cross-correlation. Here, we showcase two different workflows, one on a Nikon TIE microscope using Micromanager for data acquisition, and a second on a Nikon TI2 microscope using NIS elements to control the imaging hardware. The first reflects the system we used in the original optical pooled screening manuscript, while the second is an updated system with improved imaging throughput. For the Nikon TIE, first place a reference 96 wall plate of DAPI labeled cells onto the microscope stage to perform stage alignment. Next, load the HCS Site Generator plugin. Use the mouse move stage feature and hand tool to move the top edge into the center. Next, jog the stage to the center of the well using the stage control tool and known plate well diameter. Store the plate alignment using the Calibrate XY button in the HCS site generator. Now, load the sample plate, making sure to thoroughly wipe the glass surface with isopropanol, and adjust the HCS site generator to the 6-well format. Select the 10x objective and record a DAPI image of the well A1 center to serve as a reference for future alignment steps. Next, acquire data using the MultiD acquisition module together with the HCS site generator. First, set the exposure times and search for the ideal focal plane in each channel. The MultiD acquisition module makes it possible to set focus offsets if needed. Next, in the HCS site generator, generate a grid of imaging sites for a test acquisition. Typically, this can be about nine sites per well, arranged in a three by three grid to assess data quality. Check for staining background in all channels and make sure the entire plate is in focus. Now, generate a grid of imaging sites for the real acquisition. In this case, we'll use a 25 by 25 grid with 1280 micron spacing for NF kappa B phenotype imaging at 10x magnification. Set a save directory and initiate the full acquisition. Following the phenotypic imaging, perform the wet lab steps for the first sequencing cycle as previously shown. Once the sample is ready, load it onto the microscope, which should be roughly aligned from the previous round of imaging. Use the HCS site generator to move to the center of A1 and load the reference DAPI image to fine tune the alignment against a mask. To create the mask, adjust and apply a threshold, create a selection from the threshold, and add the selection to the ROI manager. Open the selection under Live View. Use the joystick to move the sample into alignment. and calibrate the stage using the HCS site generator. Adjust the focus and run a test acquisition using the Multi-D acquisition tool. Check the focus and sequencing background across all the test sites. If the sequencing background is high in any region, remove the plate from the microscope and perform additional heated washes with PR2 buffer until the signal to background ratio is acceptable. Once the focus and background are acceptable, proceed with launching the full acquisition.
After imaging the first cycle, use the Illumina reagents sequentially to cleave signal from cycle 1 and incorporate for cycle 2. The sample is now ready for cycle 2 imaging, which is done exactly as before. Although data for a 2019 cell paper were acquired using a Nikon TIE, LumenCore Sola light engine, Hamamatsu Flash 4 camera, and Micromanager software, we have since updated our hardware for higher imaging throughput. In particular, we use a Nikon TI2 with a powerful Celesta multi-laser source to increase image acquisition speed, as well as an Iris 9 camera with a 0.7x relay lens to increase the field of view. For data acquisition, we use NIS elements with the jobs package for easy configuration of imaging sites in multi-wall plates. For the first round of imaging, which is generally phenotyping, configure a phenotyping job as shown. Align the plate using three edge points in two or more wells. Set up the channels and imaging grid as needed. Focus the sample and initiate imaging. For subsequent rounds, align by creating a mask from the center image of the DAPI channel of first round data. This can be done by loading the image and using the define threshold, then define mask by threshold functions to mark the nuclei. Save the mask and load it when imaging the next round of data. While on live view, move the sample until the current DAPI image overlaps with the first round. Then, create an SBS job that uses center point alignment to perform all other acquisitions. Once all the sequencing data are acquired, the perturbation carried by each cell can be identified using a custom Python package available on GitHub. The major steps performed by the package functions are to align images across cycles of sequencing, identify sequencing spots, extract base intensities for each spot across all cycles of sequencing, and to call barcode read sequences following spectral compensation. Segmented cell masks are then used to determine consensus barcode calls for each cell and to map the perturbation identity to the phenotype data. An example Jupyter Notebook is provided to demonstrate the core functionality of the Python package. To scale this analysis for large datasets, it is recommended to process individual fields of view in parallel using the SnakeMake workflow management system. An example SnakeMake workflow is also supplied and can be flexibly deployed on a local computer cloud-based virtual machine, or a compute cluster.